Hello there. Hi. Hello. Hey, Julene. SD. Hi, hi. Janice. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Webby, Colby, Wonder, Brendan. Hello. Hi, everybody. By Grace New Covenant. Jax. Coach Colton. What's up? What's up? Hi, everybody. Where are you checking in from? Good morning. Type in the comments where you guys are from or where you're checking in from, whether you're there, where you're from that area or not. Let me know where you're at. And while you're getting checked in, I'm going to go ahead because it is super cold today. I'm going to get my introduction out of the way so I can get straight to today's Walk Talk Five Errors of the Early Church Fathers. If you are new to my ministry, my name's Matt McMillan, obviously. And I'm a Christian author. I've written seven books. All my books are on Amazon if you want to check them out. If you have read any of my books, I would appreciate a review. Please go back to Amazon. Leave me a quick review. I also have a, a podcast. I'm recording the latest podcast on Instagram. This is where I record it. Thank you for joining me live today. I always enjoy seeing an audience on these lives. It's very encouraging to me. But... You know, even if I was just recording this with no audience, I would still do it. <laughs> um, and if you want to access any of my past podcast episodes, I think I'm up to 160 some odd episodes now. A lot of people are letting me know that they're binging them and they're enjoying them and it's really helping them. So check that out if you get some time as well. The podcast is Walk Talks with Matt McMillan. Now, if you want to watch these podcast being recorded live, just go to my Instagram profile, hit the notification button. Oh, also, if you're listening to the podcast, pause it. If you're in a safe space, leave me a quick review on the podcast. I love seeing those as well. I am also on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, I appreciate that. Hit that subscribe button if you don't mind, if you want to subscribe. If not, I understand. Maybe you're just checking me out. Um, also, give me a thumbs up if you're enjoying it so it goes up in the algorithms on YouTube. And if you want to be notified when I release a new YouTube video, hit that bell button. So I'm pretty sure that's how that works. I am green to YouTube, so it hasn't been part of my ministry for very long, but I'm learning and I think that's an excellent platform as well. I am not a pastor. I'm a regular person just like you. The word pastor is only used once in the New Testament. I'm going to talk about the word pastor today quite a bit, so I'm not even going to dive into that in the introduction. Also, I don't know everything. I'm a regular person just like you. I get called Pastor Matt all the time, or I get called a great man of God, or just honorific titles that we just don't need. And while I appreciate the encouragement, we're equal, friends. <laughs> I'm a hand, you're a foot, or I'm a foot, you're a hand. We are all equal members of the body of Christ. Christ is the head, Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1. Now, if you want to contact me, I always welcome your interaction. To get a hold of me, please don't message me on social media. I, I don't normally interact with those, mainly because I don't keep up with them. I used to try, but now I just got a healthy boundary where... Unless we have a personal relationship, please do not message me on social media. You can still contact me, but to contact me, go to my website, go over to the contact page. I'll be glad to interact with you there. And now please don't abuse contacting me. I love you guys and I want to interact with you, but you know, just have some scruples, you know, it's real simple. Um, reach out now and again, but constant contacting me, I just, I, it just doesn't work for me. I'm not your answer for every question. And I'm not a super chatty person when it comes to non-ministry stuff, unless you are in my little circle of my family. I'm just not, I'm not down with that. So I love you, but I don't want to hurt your feelings. But please give me a little bit of breathing room. All right. I'm not that guy. Okay. That's why I always say in the beginning, I don't know everything. I'm not a pastor. Uh, you know, uh, here's what I do know. Jesus, and you know, Jesus too. We're both learning and growing together. So let's do that. And let's respect each person's healthy boundaries so, so that they can enjoy their lives, including me. All right. Now let's get to today's walk talk. Five errors of the early church fathers. Five errors of the early church fathers. Okay, now, 
So when I talk about this, first of all, (laughs) I love you guys. I love you guys. I'm never trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm never trying to cut the legs out from under what your beliefs are. My goal ultimately is to look at church history, compare it to scripture, and then you're, you, you know what you know at that point. I never tell you to do anything. I never tell you to stop listening to people. I never tell you to start listening to people. I never tell you to change your mind about something. That is not my goal. My goal is simply to expose your freedom through the truth of the gospel, and then you take it from there. I understand that even in the New Covenant community, some of these things that we learn, we just want to stick our head in the sands because we have this system set up. All right? I love you guys too. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings either. But I can't just ignore what has happened in church history, which opposes the gospel, which opposes scripture, and then just say, ah, yep, let's just, let's just ignore that. No. So we don't have to tell people what to do while it's still explaining their freedom. All right? All things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial to you. You have the freedom and the right to do any particular action or attitude. But is each particular action or attitude going to allow you to enjoy your freedom? No. Including the new covenant community. I'm going to repeat that because I've had a lot of feedback from the new covenant community in regard to me talking about the church history. And you know what? (laughs) You guys, I get that there are certain individuals that we have propped up super high above everybody else. And when we talk about church history and we see, okay, that is not an actual position according to scripture. So why is it like this? You know, we just don't know what to do even with our freedom on top of understanding our freedom in the new community, new covenant community. And, you know, when I say new covenant community, I'm talking about those who understand what happened through the cross and the resurrection. I'm not talking about those who mix the covenants. So love you guys, but I have to keep being myself. If I'm not gracious enough for you, I don't know what else to do. (laughs) I I'm, I'm, Every time I do these walk talks, my goal is to be gracious. That is ultimately my goal. Every time I do anything in regard to talking about any difficult topic, whether it's people who are struggling with stuff that is just very clear to everybody in the new covenant community or those in the new covenant community, because we have a kingdom set up even in the new covenant community with a pyramid scheme where there's a top dog of knowledge. And then you got these lay people and then you got these, oh, these other lay, 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 lay people. This stems from the early church fathers, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Again, from the beginning, I love you, take it or leave it. You know, somebody said the other day, there's bigger fish to fry. (laughs) What? What does that mean? Why is it so threatening to look at church history and still look at the new covenant? Why is that threatening? It shouldn't be threatening. You know, but they'll say, well, you're just getting bored with the gospel. No, I'm not. I still talk about the gospel the entire time I do the walk talk. But I also talk about where a lot of this error came into play. Because there's so many things that we just do because it's man-made tradition, even in the new covenant community. Even in the new covenant community. And for the fifth time, sixth time today, I love you guys. All right? You're still free. Okay? All right. So... Uh, a few things I want to recommend in case you're wanting to know, you know, where am I getting this information? So I've been studying church history for a few years now, but I normally will not talk about something, whether it was something I was learning in regard to the new covenant or anything else until I feel somewhat comfortable about it. I feel comfortable talking about church history because I've been studying it for the past few years, not like a professor, Not like somebody in college, but just somebody with my type A personality who is a student of pretty much everything and allows the Holy Spirit to, you know, take a little bit of each thing and have your own thoughts, okay? All right, now, church history is super interesting. This might not interest you. You might be like, eh, church history, who cares? The reason why I want to talk about church history is because there is so many things that we see today that are not in the Bible. So my thoughts as somebody who 
overthinks absolutely everything is why? Why is it like this? Where did it come from? Why are we just continuing these traditions if it's not in the Bible? And the only way we could come up with it in the Bible is if we superimpose, I use that word a lot, our man-made tradition onto the Bible. We have to let the Bible dictate our man-made tradition. Okay? You know, Jesus even talked about this in the Gospels when he was rebuking the Pharisees. He said, you have a fine way of setting aside the commandments of God to observe your man-made tradition. He also said, you search the scriptures to find life, but yet you never come to me. And I am the very one those scriptures are talking about. Now, I'm not saying that's you guys. There's lots of Christians who have believed, but yet they still struggle with passed down man-made tradition, traditional error. So me and the Holy Spirit, which I really think that's what has happened, being led to study church history is ultimately just going to say, okay, that's where it came from. And then you do what you want with it. All right. I'm not trying to change anything. I'm not trying to start anything. I'm not trying to set up a new structure. So I just, I, before I even talk about these five errors, I want to be clear about that. So some of the things that I've studied, three primary things that I would recommend to you. A podcast by a friend of mine named Mike Adams. And the name of his podcast is The Unsunday Show. Okay, The Unsunday Show. Now, Mike Adams is a former pastor. He was a pastor of an institutional church. When I say institutional church, I'm talking about any church because those are institutions because those churches aren't set up according to what's in the Bible. Okay. <laughs> but he was a pastor of a church. Okay. And now he has a podcast. Matter of fact, he had another podcast with him and his wife, Susan called the grace, Ca the grace cafe podcast. And they had that for a while and I loved it, but you could just hear the love in how they spoke and you can hear the love in how Mike speaks because, you know, according to <laughs> what I believe, um, he is the true definition of what an elder is according to scripture, not somebody who's in control, not somebody who has a, an office or authority, just somebody who loves you and wants to help you enjoy your freedom and what Christ has done through the cross and resurrection. Okay. So the Unsunday show with Mike Adams. All right. Then a couple books I would recommend, uh, a church building every one half mile, a church building every half mile by John Zins. Z-E-N-S. It's a short, quick read. I highly recommend it. And then there's another book, Pagan Christianity by Frank Viola, George Barna. Pagan Christianity by Frank Viola, George, George Barna. They have done, excuse me, church history study ad nauseum. And you basically get the Cliff's Notes through their book. Okay, I have studied studied this book. I've studied a church building every half mile. I've studied everything Mike said in his podcast. And this is where I'm coming up with this in regard to church history. Am I a church history historian? No, I don't have a seminary degree in this. So there's going to be parts where if you do know a lot about church history, you'll be like, oh, that's, that's a little off right there. Or nope, that's not true. But the overall Cliff's notes are true. All right. So my goal is to look at church history as a whole, okay, and then compare it to scripture and then go from there. You, then you just, these are, these, all this does is create more freedom in your mind. And Paul told the Romans to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So these free thoughts of understanding where this stuff came from. It's going to help you enjoy your freedom even more, even in the new covenant community, because it's going to get you to stop being addicted to hearing individual people who have more new covenant knowledge. Not that their knowledge is a bad thing, but that is not supposed to be what we center our lives on. There's more to it. There's a restful easiness of the gospel, a carefree way of living. Okay. So early church fathers, who are these people? <laughs> you know, Jesus said, called no man father. And a lot of people think, well, I can't call my dad father. Yes, you could call your biological father, father, but Jesus is referring to a spiritual father. Okay. Because you only have one spiritual father. That is your heavenly father. Then you have your biological father. So Jesus said, called no man father. So that right there should be a red flag. 
And then some people who look to the early church fathers for doctrine, for guidance, for leadership, for foundation of their truth, they'll say, oh no, Paul called himself father. When we look at the two times that Paul called himself father in Philippians chapter two and first Corinthians four, he was just referring to himself as an old man. He was not referring to himself as a church father. The word father is used about 350 times in the New Testament. Paul only uses it twice in regard to himself. And he's not talking about himself as this is the deal. Believe me, no matter what. Matter of fact, there were several times where Paul said, this is not from God. This is from me. I do the same thing. I'm like, this is not in the Bible. This is my opinion. Take it or leave it. Paul even did that. So Paul did not establish himself as a church father. Paul is not a church father. The early apostles' disciples were not church fathers. Why do we call these people church fathers? Because of the error of those people who labeled themselves church fathers. Okay? (laughs) So you don't have to call anybody father. Father so-and-so. Jesus said, call no man father. Okay, where are we getting this from? early church history. So a church father is just somebody who was an early believer. Now, whether or not they were believers or not, I don't know. We can't say just because somebody was born at that time frame and wrote a bunch of stuff or were really good at oration were believers. You do not know whether or not they were believers. Here's another thing in regard to these church fathers. If these air quotes, and when I say church fathers, I'm going heavy on the air quotes today because these are not church fathers. These are just old people from the beginning who were struggling with tons of error. And I'm going to talk about that today. And I've been talking about that. (laughs) Church fathers, okay? If what they said was the truth, Everything they wrote, because they wrote a lot of stuff. Clement of Rome, Tertullian, uh, Cyprian of Carthage, Ignatius of Antioch. All of these people would have had a letter in the canon of scripture. If what they said matched up to the truth of the gospel. And if they actually learned from Christ. Okay, those were the requirements to be in the canon. None of them have letters in the canon. None of them. So if what they wrote and what they established was the truth, it would have somehow made its way into scripture. God would have made that happen, but it's completely absent. But yet we go to the doctrine of early church fathers and ignore what the Bible actually teaches us. Ignatius of Antioch, for example, my entire past walk talk was on Ignatius of Antioch. Be sure to listen to that. Some of the things that he did was establish the dominance of the bishop. Now, a bishop at that time was also a pastor. They were interchangeable. They didn't use the word pastor much until the 16th century when Martin Luther came along. And then he really took that title of pastor and created what we see today. But back then, Ignatius of Antioch created a position for a person named Bishop. He was on his way to be killed in Rome. And he said, as he wrote these letters, he put the bishop in charge of everybody. Said they, if you're, if you respect the bishop, you're respecting God. Treat the bishop like you treat God. You can't do anything without the bishop present. So this early church in the first century, read this and took it as truth. But did his letters make it into the canon of scripture a few hundred years later? No. So it's not true. Why? Because those things oppose the gospel. What did Jesus say in Matthew 23? It will not be like this among you. Okay, so Ignatius of Antioch, be sure to listen to my last walk talk. He started this stuff, ultimately. All right, now, Church fathers are regular people just like me, just like you, and they struggled with error. They had to learn and grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, just like you, just like me. So let's go over the five errors of the early church fathers, and I think this is really going to help you. So uh, let's see, what's number one? Okay, number one, they created Christian 
classes. So you got first class Christian, second class Christian, third class Christian. So they were the first to use the words clergy and laity. So this started with Clement of Rome and Tertullian also wrote this way. And he distinguished professional Christians named the clergy. But when we look to scripture, do we even see the word clergy in the New Testament? Nope. It's not there. And then they also established the laity. Oh, the laity. You know, oh Lord, I got a just a laity. Bless me. You know, we've all seen those movies where there's people who they want to go kiss the clergy's ring. <laughs> Started with Clement of Rome, Tertullian, and then Cyprian of Carthage really took off with the clarity, cl uh, clergy lady distinction. So the lady is the sub Christians, the second class Christian, actually the third class, because you got the bishop, you got the elders, you got the deacons, and then you got the laity. So fourth class Christian, but they created this pyramid scheme of a, basically a kingdom with a top dog. And then you got all these subclasses. So that right there is complete error. There are not Christian classes. Again, when the when the disciples were arguing over who's going to have a higher class, air quotes, what did Jesus say? Again, if you want to be great, you must serve. But yet they have clergy who are demanding that the laity serve them. So you got those who do the ministering and you got those who are being ministered to. But yet we don't see that anywhere in the new covenant. As a matter of fact, Paul told the Corinthians, you are all competent to minister the new covenant. Paul said that. I'm competent to minister the new covenant. You're competent to minister the new covenant. We are not separate, separate, uh, separate classes. Okay? So I hope that gives you some confidence in where this distinction came from. Now, I am going to be using the word, before I go on to uh, number two, I'm going to be using the word bishop a lot today in today's walk talk. And the reason why is that at this time, the, the uh, first, second, third, fourth century, they used the word bishop more than the word pastor. They did still use the word pastor. Pastor, bishop were interchangeable, but they primarily used the word bishop. So when I say the word bishop today, you can take that as the word pastor because that evolved... A thousand years later, 1300 years later, into the pastoral position. And who established that? Martin Luther. Okay, go and listen to my past walk talks. I go, that, go into that in great detail. Martin Luther came along and said, this is all wrong. The pastor needs to be the pinnacle of the church service, not the Eucharist. And you got to hear the pastor preach or else you can't know God. And he took the word preach and pastor and interchange them, even though the word preach, preacher, uh, there's nowhere do we see preach and preacher combined with pastor in scripture. The word preach, when we hear that, we think of a man named pastor preaching. Why? Because 500 years ago, Martin Luther established this. And when he established this, Everybody grew up under it. Generations were born into it. And now here we have people who think a pastor is a preacher. A pastor is never referred to as a preacher. The word preach simply means to speak. And there were men and women who preached. I preach. I'm preaching right now. You preach whenever you speak about Jesus. So there was even a donkey who preached in the Old Testament. It's speaking. Okay, but our minds and our consciences are superimposed with what Martin Luther established with a pastor. But before Martin Luther established that, it was a bishop. Primarily, they called this leader the bishop. They did call it pastor, but it was mainly bishop. So I'm going to use the word bishop a lot today. Now, the word bishop, before I go on to number two, is not in the Bible. Some of the older translations do still say bishop, but the most authentic translations have taken that out of there because that was put into scripture in error because the Greek word is episkopon or episcopal. And that means overseer. That does not mean bishop. 
but they wanted that to be a bishop. So they put that in there. The word bishop is not in scripture. Overseer does not mean bishop. But because of what Ignatius of Antioch did with his letters, bishop, 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 all these things about the bishop, that's where we get this from. There are even some denominations who still call people on stage bishop so-and-so. But the word bishop's not in the Bible, okay? It was Episcopon, Episcopal, this is where we get that denomination from. It's been updated. We want it to be bishop. <laughs> Not we, that's a soft we. But if you grew up in this or if you're still involved with that. No, no, that's that's there and that's what it means. And my bishop this and bishop so and that. Listen, this again, I'm just bringing a light. Church history, where this came from. Search it. Okay, so number two, the second error of the early church fathers. <laughs> Oh, I love you guys. I know I know a lot of this stuff is difficult to hear. <laughs> Number two, they gave bishops and elders offices in the church. That's the second error. They gave bishops and elders offices. What's an office? It's an official position. Do we see the word elder? Yes. The Greek word is presbyteros or presbyter. So according to the early church fathers, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Tertullian, Cyprian of Carthage, you got bishop up here. If you guys are listening on the podcast, you can't see me, but I got my hand held up high at the top of the food chain. You got bishop. And then under the bishop, you got presbyters or elders or presbyteros, all the same word. Okay. And then you got deacons below them. So that was the hierarchy. And they gave them appointed offices. Now, some people will say, well, if you go to scripture, 1 Timothy 3, 1, as well as Hebrews 7, 23, both say the word office. They actually don't. The original, the original transcripts, the original manuscripts which of course went on to transcripts, transcripts, there were manuscripts, which were transcribed, and then they spread, do not have the word office. So let me just be clean and clear on that. The original Greek text does not say office. First Timothy three, verse one, again, and this wasn't written in chapters and verses. This was a letter written to Timothy who was an evangelist, not a pastor. The word pastor is not in first Timothy, second Timothy or Titus. And Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. So he was an evangelist. And when we hear evangelist, we think somebody on TV or somebody at a tent revival. No, an evangelist is just somebody who traveled and told people about Jesus. That's it. But 1 Timothy 3.1 does not say the word office. There is no office. There is no office for a pastor. There is no office for an elder. An office means official. And again, Jesus said, it's never going to be like this among you. You will not be able to lord over one another. Somebody who has an office has authority. Somebody who has an office has authority to punish you. They are above you. There's no office. This office status began with the early church fathers. Now, the early church fathers, they put the bishop in charge because of what Ignatius of Antioch established. And then as time went on, there became offices for the presbyters. So you got the bishop on top and you got these offices which were appointed by the bishop. Do we see this in scripture anywhere? No. Not one time do we see that. We see a list of qualifications to be an elder. And again, what is an elder? It is simply somebody who is mature in any particular faith. There, any particular faith. There were unbelieving elders who walked around trying to trap Jesus in his words. There were elders of John the Baptist who were elders and understood the law very well. So an elder is not somebody with an official position, which is given to you by somebody that's higher in that church system. This error started with the early church fathers. 
We see this nowhere in scripture. The only way we can come up with that is if we superimpose that onto the Bible and say, nope, this is it. You got pastor, then you got the elders, then you got the deacons, and all you guys out here, you pew potatoes, just shut up, shut up and sit down or leave. Elder so-and-so will see you to the door. Okay? Elders weren't like that. Elders, a good example of what an elder would be would be somebody like a sponsor in AA. They have no authority over you. They have no control over you. But they love you. They want to help you. They've been there. They've done that. They want to say, no, you're completely forgiven. No, you're completely righteous. No, you can't mess this up. No, the Holy Spirit won't leave you. No, you don't have to go somewhere to do something. No, you don't have to start something. No, you don't have to stop something. The gospel is easy. The gospel is burden free. The gospel is life. In this is light. In this world, you are like him. He will return without reference to sin. You have died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. All of these wonderful things about the truth of what Christ has actually accomplished that is what a ultimate true elder in the ecclesia, the body of Christ is. It's not an office. You don't have a sheriff with a bunch of deputies. But back then, that's what it was. You had the bishop who was the sheriff. And then you had all these elders, presbyters is what they called them. And they did the bidding for the, pas- for the pastor, yep, for the bishop, for the sheriff. Okay, and then you got these laity. All right, so that's where the office came from. There is no office in the body of Christ. When we see our gatherings in any particular detailed writings, it is only in 1 Corinthians 11 through 14. And everything in 1 Corinthians 11 through 14 opposes everything that the early church fathers established. Read that. We are equal it is open, it is, participar- it is participatory, it is spontaneous, it is loving one another, it is sharing, it is everybody expressing themselves, but doing it gently, respectfully, and in order, and in turn. And who is leading all of this? God, not individual people. But even when you hear the word leader, you think, oh, you got to have leaders. The only time the word leader is used in scripture is when it is referring to somebody who is leading somebody away from Judaism toward Jesus. When we see it in Romans, when we see it in Hebrews, those leaders are not church leaders. (laughs) The context is always somebody who is leading them away from the law toward grace. But you have to understand something. As humanity, we got to have some type of top-down authority, some type of leader, even in the new covenant community. And that opposes scripture. It's easier. (laughs) All right, let's go on to number three. Number three, the third error of the early church fathers. This is going to blow your mind. (laughs) You might already know this. You might not already know this, but this is super, super interesting because we see this everywhere. The early church fathers, the number, the third error, they were the first to mix the covenants. (laughs) The covenant mixture theology is the most diabolical theology on this planet. And it is, today is Sunday. I'm doing this walk talk. It's a Sunday. Law and grace will be preached together in a combination today in countless locations around me. Where did it start? Where, did Paul go from city to city to city preaching law? No. Did Paul go from city to city to city saying, yeah, Jesus is great, but you still got to keep some of these commandments. Yeah, Jesus is great. You're completely forgiven. But if you, if you don't repent, you're not forgiven anymore. Yeah, Jesus is great. But if you don't com- repeatedly confess, you won't be repeatedly forgiven. Yeah, Jesus is great. But some type of and, and confession to be forgiven wasn't even part of the law. They never confessed their sins to be forgiven. That's error as well. But this covenant mixture theology began with the early church fathers. <laughs> so Clement of Rome, as well as Cyprian of Carthage, lobbied hard in their writings to get the Old Testament order of Judaism put back into the ecclesia. And it happened. It happened big time. And Clement of uh, Cyprian of Carthage was a former sophist. He was a pagan philosopher, so he was really good at communicating. And 
all of this stuff from Judaism, they took it and they shoved it back into the gospel. Thank God they're not in the canon of scripture because it's already there enough of people twisting what's there <laughs> by not separating the covenants. But they, you know, all these things, the temples, they brought them back. The sacrifices, they brought them back. Priests, they brought them back, only they changed them and gave them power. All of these things that you see, which were jettisoned from the early church, that, you know, none of the early apostles taught any of this stuff. The, the Cyprian of Carthage, Clement of Rome, they took all that stuff from Judaism and boom, right back into the body of Christ. Here we have it. 2,000 years later, people think they got to keep a little bit of the law in with grace. 2,000 years later, people think they can actually keep the Ten Commandments when the law is not of faith. 2,000 years later, they completely ignored sin. They completely ignore what Paul said. Sin will no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. 2,000 years later, if righteousness could be attained through the law, Christ died for nothing. 2,000 years later, they ignore everything about what Christ has done, all because of Cyprian of Carthage, Clement of Rome, and I'm sure there's a lot more. But they wanted to take all this stuff from the Old Testament, shove it into the body of Christ. These early church laity just believed it because they're the laity and because they're not good at speaking. They are not trained speakers like Paul referred to. But I would have to say the worst part of what they have done is give priests power. Because even in the Old Testament, priests had no power. None. As a matter of fact, they say priests, and this is, they started calling bishops, pastors, presbyters, Priests. They started calling them priests after they took the stuff from the old covenant and put it into the ecclesia. One of those words was priest. They started calling the top dog priest. We are never called individual priests with any type of power on this side of the cross. Peter said you are all members of a royal priesthood. In the book of Revelation, it says we are all priests unto God. But none of us have any power according to our individuality at an individual location or over anybody. That is complete error. And that stems from Cyprian of Carthage. It is so bad. They said priests have the power to forgive men their sins. So they took something that Jesus said from John chapter 20. If you forgive people, their sins are forgiven. And then they said right there, priests can forgive you of your sins right here. These were the disciples. They were not priests. And they were all Jewish. They knew they had no power to forgive anybody of their sins. They knew the only way you could be forgiven is if you go to the temple once a year at the Day of Atonement. So what did Jesus mean? Jesus was referring to himself, the message. He was sending them all out, telling people about himself. Go out there and tell them. If you forgive them, their sins are forgiven. It's the same thing with me telling you. The cross completely forgave you. Believe it. Your sin is offered up. Is everybody forgiven? No, not everybody's forgiven because 1 John 1, 9 is written to somebody. But they went out with the message about Jesus. The same message you have today. Same message I have today. You're completely forgiven. You're completely righteous. All you got to do is trust Jesus by grace, by no work of your own. But yet the early church fathers took the word priest, gave them this position, and then here we have it. All right, let's go on to number four. They gave bishops their own church. And again, bishop, pastor, same thing, priest. Individual branches, autonomous branches, and what did Jesus say about an autonomous branch? You can do nothing on your own. <laughs> We're now led by individual people who had their own church.
let that soak in. Individual people having their own church began with the early church fathers, primarily Cyprian of Carthage. So you, Bishop so-and-so, you get your own church. Only they didn't call it a church. Okay, The word church wasn't even in the Bible until the 13th century. It was just a place of worship, a temple. So they took their paganism, uh, their temples from paganism, because they were all pagan. A pagan is simply somebody who is non, uh, not a believer. And then they created Christian temples, Christian style basilicas. So you get your own church. You get your own church. You get your own church. You're the head of the church, and then you've got your elders under you, your presbyters, presbyteros. Started with this. How often do we hear that today? When you tell somebody, I'm a Christian, or you get to talking about being a Christian, the first thing they say, nine out of 10 times, where do you go to church? This is where it started. You know, Clement of Alexandria said, you cannot go to where you are. But because of these early church fathers creating this error of individual edifices, places, air quotes, of worship, and then assigning those buildings, those locations, to the bishop, this is what we get. And here we have it. (laughs) You know, not only that, they don't just say, where do you go to church? They say, oh, that's pastor so-and-so. Oh, yeah, I love him. See it? (laughs) Or, oh, yeah, I used to go there. I don't like him. Oh, he said this. Oh, they think that. Oh, no. And then they start talking individually, start talking bad about that individual pastor in that church because they sat under that teaching or they don't like their teaching or they said something that insulted them while they sat in the crowd passively. It's because of this stuff right here. They gave pastors, bishops, their own church. You don't have your own church, friend, (laughs) even in the New Covenant community. I love you. It's not your church. There is no pastoral position. (laughs) This started with Ignatius of Antioch, and then it was perpetuated with Clement of Rome, (laughs) and then it spread like wildfire with Cyprian of Carthage, and then you got Constantine, who was the emperor of Rome, saw all of this stuff which was already established through these early church fathers, and with his power and might, he, boom, put a stamp of approval on it, and it spread all over the world. And then here we have it. (laughs) All right, let's go on to number five, the fifth error of the early church fathers. These These are fun to talk about. The fifth error, and it is bone chilling cold today. Hopefully you guys can't really tell that, but I'm snotty and my hand is frozen stiff right now, (laughs) but I am getting this walk talk in (laughs) because I like doing them. All right. The fifth error of the early church fathers, they gave power to the bishop over church rituals. They gave power to the bishop, pastor, over church rituals. And some flavors of Christianity, it's still a bishop. It's still a priest. (laughs) So before this, there were no church rituals. (laughs) There were no sacraments. There were no rites. There, There was nothing. There was no hierarchies. There was no people who had their own church. There was no structure as far as an office. There was no edifice of or a place of worship you are the place of worship paul paul said you are the temple of the holy spirit paul said in the book of acts god does not dwell in places built by human hands you are the house of god hebrews chapter 3 tells us but here we have error from the early church fathers being everywhere today but when they gave them power over church rituals You know, I I don't even like saying that title because there are no church rituals. And that's why I just said what I just said. But let's talk about some of those air quote church rituals. First of all, communion. (laughs) 
they turned what was supposed to be a full meal of the early church, the ecclesia, the body of Christ, getting together once a week to have a full meal together to commune and to remember what Christ has done into a sacrament to where only the priest who was now only subsequent to God, who was holy, just like the air quote priests of the Old Testament, even though the priests of the Old Testament were not holy. They even had to offer sacrifices for their own sins before they could do it for the sins of the people. But let's just ignore that for a little bit. And they said that you cannot have anything to do with communion unless a priest, a bishop, a presbyter, a pastor administers this to you. What the freaking crap? Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me at the last supper. But yet we do this and we have to wait on somebody to get there in order to give it to us. And then what do we do? We remember our sins. We don't remember what Christ has done with our sins. Here we are remembering something that the book of Hebrews says he remembers no more. But to top this gigantic load of dung off with a, a turd cherry, we say, oh, you can't even have this unless the priest is present and he has to administer it. Trash, trash. Okay, I can feel myself getting a little triggered right here. I'm going to bump my brakes. Calm down. You've been doing good, McMillan, this whole time. You've been gracious. I'm going to stay gracious. I am gracious. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, I grew up under all this stuff. You know, when I was in the foster home system, I, I dealt with it uh, many different styles of Christianity. So I've dealt with all of this different stuff. So I know, I know how each individual group of people feel from this error, which was set up from the early church fathers, which is completely ignoring what 1 Corinthians 11 says, where it's a full meal, get together. If you can't, if you can't stop binge eating and binge drinking and, and judging one another because you're getting there before everybody else and eating everything up, eat at home. But yet we want to turn the lights down and say, remember your sin and let the cup pass if you sin too big or too much. So what happens there? Oh, my sin wasn't that bad. Let me get that. Let me get that Welch's. Or oh, my sin is too bad. I'm not drinking this. It is to do it in remembrance of what Jesus has done, not remembrance of your sins. What's even worse, Cyprian of Carthage turned this into what's called the Eucharist. So where do we get this Eucharist from? If you don't know what a Eucharist is, this is the climax. Oh, the best part of the Catholic Mass. And Gregor Gregory the Great, who established Cath the Catholic Mass about 500, 600 AD, took all this stuff from the early church fathers. So in regard to the Eucharist, he got this from Cyprian of Carthage. So who came up with the Eucharist? Cyprian of Carthage came up with the Eucharist. What's the Eucharist? The Eucharist, for all you people out there who don't know what the Eucharist is, because it's really weird, and it should be really weird, because it is error. It is the literal sacrificing of Jesus for your sins again. How? By breaking bread and wine. Body, blood. To make this worse, literal, and I know what literal means. This is literal. This is not symbolic. And that's what the, the Lord's Supper was meant to be symbolic, to remember what Christ has done. But calm down. Calm down. You can do this. <laughs> See, this part, I, I agree with Martin Luther on this. The Eucharist, which was created by one man, this thought that he had, is demonic. It's ignoring the finality of the cross. You calm down. <laughs> calm down. You can do this. Oh. So when they do the Eucharist, they honestly believe that this priest who is air quotes holy, calm down. This priest who is air quotes holy <laughs> can can intercede for you through re-sacrificing Jesus through the body and the blood for your sins. And when you eat this, you are literally being re-forgiven again through a literal re-sacrificing of Jesus. What the freaking crap? No, that opposes everything scripture says. 
everything. Jesus said, it is finished. He, uh, Hebrews chapter one says, after providing, after providing purifi- purifications for skin, sins, he sat down. Christ will not offer his blood for, for your sins ever again, symbolically or literally. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Much less this placebo of a priest who is somehow interceding for you when there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. There is no Eucharist. Communion was a meal. They got together. They ate. They drank. And these crazy Corinthians were doing it in an unworthy manner. How? They were eating all the food, drinking all the wine, not waiting on everybody to get there. And they were judging one another. And Paul's saying, hey, let's not do that. Let's get together and have some manners. But yet we want to take one part of... Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. I haven't been super triggered in a while. Uh, in many of my walk talks. Oh, man. So the reality is the Eucharist... It was created by Cyprian of Carthage. Cyprian of Carthage took all this stuff from the Old Testament. Holy places, uh, sacrifices, uh, priests, uh, all this stuff which Jesus finalized at the cross as they nailed these nails into his hands and feet. And they just, they want to, they want to re-sacrifice the Messiah and you cannot do that. The life he lives, he lives forever. He is able to save you forever because he always lives. He is able to save you completely. So we have to get to the point of understanding this error of receiving some type of literal body and blood through some something that you know they made with flour and water and welches coming from somebody who was in religious garb, which that began... That began with the sophists and then <laughs> just so much. There's just such a cornucopia of just dung. And it all came from the early church fathers and it opposes the easiness of the gospel. It opposes the body of Christ with many members. You know, Paul said, if there's only one member, where's the body? And here we have it. You know what else Cyprian and Carthage did? He lobbied to have bishops traced back to Peter. He started that too. Because he wanted to say, oh, Peter was the first bishop. No, he was not. Peter was a hothead who struggled with covenant mixture theology. Tried to cut the guy's ear off, probably killed Ananias and Sapphira, wouldn't eat with the Gentiles in Galatia. Abandoned, abandoned G, uh, Jesus, denied him three times. Jesus called him the devil. Yet we want to say he's the original. This started from Cyprian of Carthage. All of this error just started from all of these early church fathers. Ignatius of Antioch was bad. <laughs> Clement of Rome, Tertullian. You know, Clement, it seems to me like Clement of Alexandra. He, he might have had things right, you know, because he said sermons are a bad thing for the body of Christ. He also said, you cannot go to where you are. You cannot go to a place that you are. Church. Uh, but we screwed it up from the beginning, guys. You know, if I was back there, I could have been one of those early church fathers doing some dumb stuff. But they're not. They're not unfallible. And if we compare what they did, the things they wrote, the things they said to what scripture teaches us about how there is no leader, there is no top dog, nobody can lord over others. We don't have to get information from one individual for an hour each week, even in the new covenant community in order to be able to function. Am I against that? 
I'm not against it, but I'm saying that is not how the body of Christ was established. 1 Corinthians 11 through 14 is the only comprehensive section of scripture. And we see a group. We see spontaneity. We even try to, uh, we try to superimpose church onto other books of the Bible, such as Romans 12, Ephesians 4, Hebrews. Th th those have nothing to do with church. They're talking about everyday life. How often do you go to a church? And how often do you live your life? Why do we put all of this emphasis onto individuals, onto rites, rituals, customs, buildings, locations, behavior, performance? It is because of the error of the early church fathers, and it continues on today. 2,000 years later, and you talk about this stuff, you're going to be ostracized. So freaking what? Who cares? You know, if somebody's only going to be your friend or have anything to do with you because you are. <laughs> Just get off that mat. Just get off of it. <sighs> it's easier. It's burden free. It's light. And what's really sad about this is there are a lot of pastors who, who know all this stuff. They know where these errors came from. They know what Martin Luther established. They know what John Calvin perpetuated. They know how the Puritans came over with this. They know how all of these buildings around here are just teaching covenant mixture theology and Christ is not the center. Everybody's not getting a chance to, to, to take their turn and, and <laughs> express Christ and love one another and build somebody up with their edification, encouragement, and consolation. They know all of this. But because this system is so ironclad, set in stone, they don't know what to do. They'll even, they'll even say something to me. What should I do? I don't know. It is not my place to tell anybody what to do. I am not here to create anything new. All I want to do is point out that's where it came from. This is what scripture teaches us. And I know, here's what I do know. If it's easy, if it's burden free, if it's light, if it's expressing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, if it's keeping no records of wrongs, if it's not delighting in the evil, but the truth, if it is worshiping in spirit and truth, <laughs> if it is you're completely forgiven because of the cross, you're completely righteous because of the resurrection, there's nothing wrong with you. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not sinful. You are holy. You are blameless. You are righteous. You're a new creation. If it's all of those things right there, that's it. Live, be. So, oh, but we don't have that. We've got pew potatoes with a dominant head figure. We've got a pyramid scheme with pastor, elder, deacons, congregation. We've got the church lotto, this Christian Ponzi scheme with religion to back it up. We got put God first when God has put you first. We got serve the Lord when Jesus rebuked Peter for not letting him serve him. All of these things, we got all of the opposite of what the easiness is of what the spirit in me, in you, should be expressing. So, all right, guys. So I hope this has encouraged you today. I really do <laughs> hope it has encouraged you today. I hope it's brought to light maybe some error about the early church fathers. And um, I hope it's made things simpler. The simpler, the better. And when you understand where something came from, you can, kind of, you can kind of understand why things are like they are. All right? All right, guys. So always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous. 
You're holy. You're blameless. You're a child of God. You're a new creation. There is nothing wrong with you. <laughs> and you are awesome. So always tell the truth about yourself and always be yourself. Love y'all. Bye.